Hello, and thank you all for joining us both here on our webinar and on YouTube Live. My name is Nathan Winkelstein. I am the Associate Artistic Director of Red Bull Theatre, and I will be moderating this evening's Bull Session, our discussion on the play The African Company Presents Richard III, which we just did a reading of this past Monday, which I'm assuming all of you have seen. Um, however, for those of you who have friends who haven't seen it, who you wish to, it is still available to be watched on Red Bull's webpage or on our YouTube page until tomorrow at 7 p.m. So you've got about 24 hours to tell all your friends about it. Please do. Um, I'm assuming because you are all here, you all like it. So uh, after tomorrow, it disappears for forever. Um, I just want to go quickly over how this is going to work this evening. You can see at the bottom of your screen that you have a Q&A function. If you, if you click on the Q&A function, you can type in questions. Because of the settings it's on right now, you will not see other people's questions. So don't let, uh, don't let it discourage you or make you nervous. If it feels like you're the only person asking questions, uh, you aren't, go for it. If you're also interested in engaging a little bit more when asking a question and you want to ask it in your own voice uh, with your own intonations, et cetera, uh, then after you've typed the question in the Q&A, also click the little hand raise button. I'll be able to see that. If I end up choosing your question from the Q&A and I see that your hand is raised, I will ask you to unmute and you can ask the question with your own voice. Uh, it does not affect which questions I choose, so don't feel like you must in order to get your question answered. It's just there for the fun of it. Great, enough about all of that. Let me introduce the people that you're here to see. Um, first of all, the Associate Artistic Director of Classical Theatre of Harlem and the director of this reading, the wonderful Carl Cofield, is with us. Uh, then the playwright of the wonderful show you saw on Monday, whose work speaks for itself, obviously, the wonderful playwright Carlisle Brown. And then finally, our guest scholar for the evening, Marvin Edward McAllister, who is the associate professor at Winthrop University in South Carolina. He has multiple books published. He's been a dramaturg and literary manager for theaters across the country. Thank you all for joining this evening. I'm thrilled to have you all to talk about such a very, very cool play. Um, let me start by handing it off to Marvin, our to Marvin, our scholar. Marvin, you were telling me earlier about how there were so many historical threads in this play that were fascinating to go down, but that you found one particularly intriguing. Could you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, so um, I was given about three or four minutes to pull at one of these threads. And so the thread that I want to pull at is in Act 2, Scene 3, there's a mashup of Hamlet's To Be or Not To Be speech and A Possum Up a Gum Tree. And so um, just a little bit of background. Uh, the story behind that infamous blackface Hamlet begins with a British writer and solo performer, performer named Charles Matthews. Now, Mr. Matthews was sort of like the Anna Devere Smith of his time. He would roll up on the community and he would uh, get into the ethnic and racial culture of that community, be it French, Spanish, uh, Italian, American, black, white. And he would develop these satiric or parodic figures using a combination of monologues, songs, dances, and even ventriloquism sometimes. And so after studying and scripting the, peculiar, the, pu the pu peculiar, peculiarities of these specific cultures, Matthews would pull it all together in these solo specialty acts that he called at home. And so in September, 1822, Stephen Price invited Charles Matthews to perform at the Park Theater and tour all the major theaters in the US. But Matthews agreed to do this because he also had another plan. He wanted to develop an at home specifically about America called A Trip to America. And so he came to New York, but there was a wrench in these plans. When he came to New York in September 1822, a yellow fever epidemic had just hit the city in the summer of 1822. And so New York was still recovering from this major yellow fever outbreak. All the theaters were closed, as we can imagine how that feels. And the park was somewhat functional because Stephen Price, always being the hustler, he made a deal with the owner of a circus out in Greenwich Village, and that circus manager allowed him to set up shop out at that circus. So the Park Theater was actually still functioning, but the rest of the theater, the rest of the theater committees were pretty much shut down, including William Brown's company. Now, William Brown's company wasn't shut down because of the fever. 
his company was actually shut down because in August of 1822, there was a riot at his theater where a bunch of circus performers basically busted up the theater, beat up William Brown, ripped off the costumes of the players and basically shut the theater down for a little bit. And so Charles Matthews who wanted to check out William Brown's theater couldn't because it was shut down and he couldn't check out other establishments because of the yellow fever. So Price made arrangements for Matthews to uh, actually meet uh, James Hewlett and for James Hewlett to do a private performance for Matthews. And so James Hewlett being the triple threat actor that he is, he dazzled the, uh, uh, the, the British visitor with his best Shakespearean pieces. And we know this because Hewlett actually wrote about that encounter and we'll get into that later, all right? So while in New York, Charles Matthews not only was introduced to James Hewlett, but he was also exposed to what I call in my books, written blackface minstrelsy. So what is that? That's a tradition of white media ridiculing black progress and black excellence. One practitioner of this actually shows up in Carlisle Brown's play. And that practitioner, practitioner of this brand of mistressy was a guy named Manuel Mordecai Noah. He was the editor of the National Advocate and he was the sheriff of Manhattan. The arrest at the center of this play was partly orchestrated by Manuel Mordecai Noah. So from 1821 in all his reviews and his articles, his editorial comments about Brown's entertainments, Noah relentlessly minstrelized and mocked the work of these black actors, these black artists. The review that Brown treats us, that Carlisle Brown gives us in the first act of the play is actually Manuel Mordecai Noah's words. In fact, Noah is the one who came up with the term African grow and he did it to be mocking and derisive, right? And so, Noah's minstrel work or his written blackface minstrel work was uh, followed up by other white writers in the period like Simon Snipe who, and Mr. Twats. They published their own separate accounts of allegedly attending Brown's theater. And they also published these accounts in various local newspapers like the National Advocate or the Spectator. So all these writers were making big fun of uh, William Brown and his entertainments. And Charles Matthews decided to participate in all of this written blackface minstrelsy. In his personal letters, he would actually refer to it as quote unquote, black fun. So after developing his work for about a year, this a trip to America, he finally debuted it in March, 1824 in London. And he debuted it featuring this malapropic character called the black tragedian. And that act, the solo act, you can read it because uh, A Trip to America is published. It's the pretty much the exact same act that Carlisle Brown gives us in act two, scene three of the African Company, all right? Now, Hewlett was pissed when he heard about this caricature that Matthews created. And he actually heard about it while Matthews was cooking it up. He actually knew about it before it even debuted. And so allegedly, and we don't, we don't know if this is true, Allegedly, Hewlett traveled over to London because he was going to confront Matthews directly. We don't know if that happened, but we do know that in May 1824, Hewlett published an open letter in Manuel Mordecai Noah's National Advocate. And in that letter, he comes for Matthews. He berates him for making fun of, for ridiculing actors of color, especially uh, James Hewlett, because James Hewlett describes how all of his Shakespearean pieces that he did for Matthews were to perfection. And there was no opossum up at nothing in any of his performances. And so he basically dressed down uh, Charles Matthews for ridiculing his performance. But Hewlett wasn't done. He struck back even further. The counter publicity that Hewlett had in mind didn't stop there. We have at least two playbills from 1824 and 1826 when Hewlett announces that he's gonna be performing a piece called Charles Matthews, A Trip to America, right? So he's gonna perform A Trip to America, but instead of having that black tragedian character with the mashup of Hamlet and the Possum of a Gumtree, Hewlett substitutes that character with a solo specialty act simply called Hewlett. Now we have no idea what exactly Hewlett looked like or what that performance looked like, but that's how Hewlett got back at Charles Matthews. Now to close though with this little thread, we know about that malapropic blackface Hamlet, not really because either Charles Hamlet, I'm sorry, Charles Matthews or James Hewlett. We actually know about it because of another famous actor, Ira Aldridge. So in the late 1820s, while Ira Aldridge was building a name for himself, 
in English provisional theaters, provincial theater, sorry, many theater managers and audiences who, were knew, who knew about A Trip to America, they automatically assumed that that black tragedian was actually about Ira Aldridge. And Ira Aldridge let them think that because that connection got him gigs. So he didn't disabuse them of that notion. However, they kept hounding him. Audience and theater managers kept hounding him to do that. So finally, he relented in May 1830 and finally added this black tragedian character, just like we see in act two, scene three of, of the African company. He finally added that to his repertoire and it stayed in his repertoire for the next 10 years, all right? So that was the one thread that I wanted to sort of draw out. So Nate, well, do you want me to uh, uh, add this next question? No, absolutely, because I know you have a I know you have a question for Carlisle. I just wanted to say thank you. I'm sort of reeling from the knowledge dump that just happened. Oh, um, no, 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 no. I please, no. I mean it. I mean it sincerely. It's such a it's a part of our history that should be more known than it is, and it's just shocking to hear it in those terms. Thank you for that. And yes, please. I know that you have a have a question for Carlisle, so please pass it along. All right. So during the reading on Monday, what really popped for me and and, and, and stuck with me, and I'm sure it did for other. Uh, folks who attended the reading. Papa Shakespeare was a character that resonated with me on multiple levels. And he felt like the emotional and spiritual engine, not just for this particular story, but actually for all of William Brown's entertainments. So the basic question I have for Carlisle is how did you arrive at Papa Shakespeare? How did he emerge? Where did he come from? Uh, Carlisle, you're muted. I, I always do that. Um, well, of course, you know, um, you know, play is, you know, is a fiction and not as a reenactment of history. And, um, you know, in terms of the, the importance for me as an artist of what, you know, the African company meant is, you know, about storytelling, you know, and the purpose of storytelling. And as I am a storyteller and Papa Shakespeare is quite naturally, you know, the griot um, introducing that, That voice that sort of, for me, resonates where um, the experience of early African Americans and all African Americans come from the Atlantic slave trade and you know Afro-Atlantic culture, um, and so you know we naturally had to, um, I naturally had to have a character who had spoke to that, you know, you know both uh, you know, metaphorically and and otherwise, um, because. You know, the, um, uh, the early part of my working life, I was like a, I was well, not like, I was a sailor. I skippered 19th century sailing vessels. And so I look at, you know, the Afro-Atlantic world as a kind of physical world, you know, of the slave trade and where African-Americans were dispersed as commodities throughout the Atlantic world, not just in America. And, you know, that um, culture still resonates today. You know, that voice which speaks to uh, a world that looks at the experience, the traumatic experience of slavery and the Afro-Atlantic slave trade is something that is shared throughout the transatlantic basin. And when we look at culture in the transatlantic basin, uh, from my point of view, the Atlantic Basin is a cultural lake where the coast of West Africa is the principal transporter of culture. That I feel that America is cultural colony of West Africa. Thank you, Carlisle. Um, Feel like I had a follow-up question, and then that that last one kind of blew my mind again a little bit. Um, let me let me hand it actually quickly off to Carl because Carl's the one we haven't heard from yet. Carl, uh, you were uh, this play was in your head beforehand, right? From your time as an actor at the acting company, you weren't in it, but you had sort of overlapped a bit. So I know that you've been sort of in and around this play for a while. How was it for you? Obviously, this play has a lot of things that are very resonant for today and a lot of historical context that's really important for us to learn. How was it for you tackling this script and knowing that you were 
going to put up this presentation online and what what did you feel like you wanted to particularly bring out of the script and pursue well you know let me take the the second question first first of all it was a great honor you know i've long been a, a fan of carlisle brown's work uh, especially when i was an actor right um one of the the charges i think uh are one of the, the, the great joys was finding these stories, these rich stories in our past that we didn't really know about, that we didn't really engage with. And so revisiting Carlisle's work um, was an extraordinary privilege. The first thing that jumped out to me is this beautiful mosaic he creates with the voices, right? Um, I'm a big fan of creating our own dramaturgy. And I think Carlisle does that exquisitely with the different voices of the, uh, of the diaspora that we hear. Papa Shakespeare doesn't sound like Billy Brown. Billy Brown doesn't sound like Hewlett. Uh, so it's this beautiful cacophony, which automatically puts me in New York in the 1820s. We have the Irish voice in, we have the aristocratic voice in, and we have these beautiful uh, 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 voices of the diaspora, which really, uh, um, reading it, I could hear my grandmother's wisdom coming out through the pages. I could hear my uh, uncle who is also tra uh, tra tracked through August Wilson. I could hear the beautiful play on Shakespearean uh, 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 language spoken through a different sort of uh, a vernacular. So when we're in theater school, they always teach us the mid-Atlantic sound and they want you to suppress what makes you authentic. But what's beautiful with Carlisle's work is it requires the actor and it requires the company to bring all of their true self to the forefront. So uh, that was thrilling, that was uh, exhilarating and um, not to be educational, but to really have this conversation about my lineage as a black man in the arts, right? And to connect the dots to the Billy Browns, to the Hewlett's, to the Ira Aldridge's. These are the stories that are in the pantheon of the black theater maker, but to spend time to grapple with the work and reinvestigate it, uh, it just seems so current. It seems right now, even though it's in the history, it seems so fresh. So it, it's a tremendous, it was a tremendous honor. Thanks, Carl. Um, let me do my, my requisite reminder to our, our attendees to please do write questions because this is mostly about y'all. Um, so, oh, I, let me, um, and then let me, I'll, I'll be reading the cues that come in in just a second, but I, I wanted to toss it back actually off of what Carl said, back to you, Carlisle, if you don't mind, like we've we've now spoken a bit about the, um, the, the incredible historical resonance of this piece you've written. Uh, but of course, as everybody saw on Monday, uh, this isn't a, it, it's not a documentary and it's not a, it's, it's a, it's a piece of theater with, with fully realized characters and, um, who have personal stakes outside of the kind of grand stakes, um, the macro stakes. And so I, I was just wondering if you could give us a little bit of insight into your process as a playwright, because from I'm in the midst of reading one of your other plays right now, it does seem like, as Carl said, kind of picking out these stories that we don't know as much about as we should is something that you clearly do. But what what makes you such a great playwright, obviously, is that you then make them very real people. And can you talk about like how it is for you balancing those two aspects of knowing you're telling this historic tale, but also wanting to tell a tale about real, fully realized characters? Um, gee, that's, you know, I don't really know if I can answer that question. I mean, you know, um, I, I um, you know, like the notion of the griot which is in, in, in West Africa is, you know, that's something that like I personally identify with as a storyteller, that I'm fundamentally a storyteller. And, you know, the purpose of the griot and, you know, West African culture and it's ancient uh, and, you know, when it has, you know, a long tradition, you know, uh, griots, they start their apprenticeship at eight years old and they have to learn the Korah and their job is to learn to, tell the, uh, to do a recitation of the history of the people. And I think, you know, in terms of the transference of uh, culture from, from West Africa to uh, America, I would say that the equivalent of the griot is um, 
you know, the Baptist preacher and the blues singer, and, you know, uh, you know those cultural carriers who are carrying on that tradition on this side of the Atlantic, right? And so I consciously identify with that, right? And I feel that like, you know, the writers of the Renaissance and whatever are sort of doing the same thing is sort of rectifying the trauma of our experience in the transatlantic slave trade to, to in our oppression, um, help each other um, deal with this dilemma of being black in uh, white America. So, um, you know, if I feel like if I'm gonna be an artist, then it's my charge to kind of carry that on. So that's where that's coming from. Thank you. Um, ooh, I have an echo, is anyone else hearing that? Okay, I think it's cleared up. Um, the We actually just got a question which it's almost like they knew that I needed a transition because I'm now going to introduce the two actors who are joining us. Um, the two actors uh, that we have with us tonight who, proud, who kindly agreed to join us are Dion Johnstone and Jessica Williams, who you both of them you saw in the production on Monday, if you two could join the conversation. Uh, thank you. And one of the questions, actually, uh, it's, it's directly for Carlisle, but I think that it would be interesting to hear Dion's uh, impression on, especially when it comes to storytelling and developing a real character inside the plays, is Vivian Martin asks um, to talk about the inclusion of the Queen Anne refusal scene, the refusing to read the Queen Anne scene, and what is the importance of that scene? Is it hist of historic importance, or is it more about the relationship building in the play, et cetera? And then I'd be, I'd love to know what Dion's thoughts were on uh, on acting that scene op opposite Antoinette. Well. Um... You know, I wrote this play a long time ago, so I can't tell you what the like definite initiator of, but as I look at it, it's just, or as I receive it back from actors that do that scene, is it just, it's just fun. It just allows, uh, you know, uh, black actors to say that like, yo, I can do my thing and I can do your thing and I can mix them up together <laughs> and, you know, and, uh, you know, make all kinds of sort of sense of it. You know, I mean, you know, the thing is about, um, you know, the culture thing of, you know, uh, you know, black people creating their own culture in, you know, America as an oppressed people is that we are masters of subtext, right? I mean, we, you know, can talk to each other in front of white people and, uh, you know, they have no idea what we're talking about, but they think they know something else. You know what I mean? And it's, so it is the, um, the pressure cooker of the oppression that like magnifies our creativity, right? You know, that's why black folks are deep, right? So, um, and you know, it kind of, so for me, that was sort of an expression of like what that looks like, right? You know, where, um, you know, in terms of language or expression or, and then, you know, the whole idea of the supremacy of, you know, the like, you know, the white classic, you know, I mean, like, and think this is a bunch of bull, this is like a repressive, you know, sort of thing. But then on the other hand, it sort of reflects of what, um, how oppressed women were in that society. I mean, like, Anne in that scene, she's doing that because she needs a protector, right? She's just gonna be like, she can't say like, well, hell, you, hell, with you, Richard, you know, like, I'm not going for that. You know, I mean, she has to, but like Anne has. So, um, so all of those kind of ideas were sort of resonated with me, I think, when I was writing it at the time. Um, Dion, uh, thank you. Thank you again for joining us. I, you uh, did such a beautiful job in the, in the reading on Monday. Um, and uh, for the Red Bull audiences, obviously, they all know you very well from playing Coriolanus. Um, and uh, can you talk a little bit both about like that scene, which I think is a wonderful kind of introduction to the real life person you're playing, but also just the experience you had working with this text, inhabiting this this historic figure, but in through the lens of Carlisle's play? Yeah, I mean, what I really love about that scene in particular is, is there's so many contrasts that that are going on. And, and, you know, when you look in the second act, when Billy Brown asks 
you know, Hewlett, you know, what do you, what do you, what do you get out of this? And he says, I get to be, uh, you know, openly admired. I get to, you know, the robe, the costumes, the, 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 the crown. It's like, I get to remold myself. Like I'm, like I'm glay. I like, like this is glass that I know how to polish. And, and in doing that, I show the world, I show this society that I can be any man, that I'm not held back by the color of my skin. I'm not held back by what people, what society has made us as, as a, a culture in terms of how we've been limited. I get to be anybody. I get to dream. And, and, and so, you know, that's really what I leaned into, you know, in, in terms of his motivation for him, that's the escape. And for him, that's the, the, the freedom and the freedom is in the, the language and being able to do the language well, to do it exceptional. Um, but Fran, it's, it's, it's not, it's not a play. They're not, they're not words. She's, the true actor in, in, in the sense that there's no difference between her and what she, what she speaks. That's her heart out there. And, and so that's a very vulnerable position for her to be out there saying those words. And, and, uh, and so it's, it's wild playing that, that, that contrast. He, he's unable to, to, to see that. Um, he's unable to see that, that she's in, in, in love with him. And, and this, is, this, is a, a, this is a real scene that's happening between them. Um, but for him, it's it's the, the within the context of a of a play, and uh, um, I love that. I, it, as an actor, it's just fun to be playing those kind of of dynamics and and to know that those layers are 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 there. Yeah. Thanks, Dion. Um, I have a, there's one question that just came in from an anonymous attendee uh, that I it says for Carlisle or Carl, but I actually think that this is an open question to the room. Um, which is, uh, how does this play resonate differently for you in our time now versus when you wrote or encountered it for the first time, or for those of you who are encountering it now, how did it resonate for you? Um, especially as you think about uh, Black Lives Matter, We See You White American Theater, and even the less recent but still powerfully important August Wilson, Robert uh, Brewstein debates. Uh, normally I, I pick somebody to go to, but I wonder if anybody is particularly uh, anxious to jump on that. Sweet. <laughs> Can you know, if I could just say a little something, what I love about this play, I'd never encountered this, this, this play before, but I had encountered this, this history, which wasn't taught to me in, in school. Only when I uh, went to play Ira Aldridge in, in Red Velvet and started to research Ira Aldridge. And then I came across the African Theatre Company and James Hewlett and this amazing, rich history, which is quite phenomenal because it's also New York history and it's, and it's theater history and, and it's African-American history. It's, it's a, a, an incredible intersection of, 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 of events. And to, to be made aware and to be able to see uh, you know, in front of you, the contributions that African Americans have made to this art, uh, quite literally, is 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 amazing. And I think, you know, what my might my work be like? Where might my career be um, as a, as a classical actor or just as an actor? Had I known when I was going through school? Had I known as a young man that these were the shoulders that that I was already standing on? I didn't know that. I felt that I was anomaly. I, I felt that I was one of a kind and, and fighting uh, a, a battle that, that seemed like, I don't know if I'll ever get to, to play the leader or, or if I'll ever get to play a lover or if I'll ever get to play the hero. I'm always kind of the servant or the, you know? And so I felt I was fighting those battles for the, for the first time to get, you know, companies to, to recognize me as more, but to know that others had done this and, and to great excellence before me would have made a massive difference. So Carlisle, I have to, I have to thank you and credit you for, for writing this play and putting this out there so, so that this next generation of artists have, have the opportunity to see this history and, and to wonder about it and to go and do their research and know that it's all laid out there. It's just been sort of buried and it hasn't been claimed by, by our, our theater history. And I think it's time, it's time to claim that. Well, well thank you, thank you, Dion. Um... I um I'd like to bring up something that like you know maybe I don't know 
it, it might be a little darker. <laughs> and, you know, if you don't mind, but you know, playwrights, you know how we are. But, um, uh, you know, one of the things, uh, you know, in the play, in terms of, uh, you know, performance, um, is, uh, well, there are, like, there are a couple of things about, in terms of, like, acting, the rest of the classical acting thing is that there, there are a couple of things about the play, and that's seeing that possum up a gum scene, uh, you know, uh, gum tree scene that, that, that Marvin like originally talked about was, um, you know, in the early days, I, I always thought that that was really a difficult thing for, well, there was one instance I can really speak of, uh, really, is uh, an actor had a problem sort of playing that scene. You know, it was, um, you know, the producer had called me and said it was actually kind of particularly awful the way it was done, you know, playing that scene. You know, um, and um, so I don't know, for some reason, I was delegated to go to another town and talk to this actor and, and see if I could, could, could help him. And um, he, um, when we finally kind of got to have a conversation, he, um, I didn't really know what, 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 what the problem was. And he, he um, I, I, I thought that like, well, he, all, all the, all the, um, you know, monologues in the play were like a direct address. You were talking to the audience, you know, that's right there. And he was doing that scene in a very presentational way. You know? And um, so I said, well, you know, um, it's, it's, so the, the people that are talking, it's not presentational, you know, everybody, Every monologue in the play is like the character telling the audience how you feel about such and such a thing, right? And I said, but you're doing it like sort of, you know, pres presentation, I mean, like it's... So he said something to me, um, uh, which um, oftentimes actors try to say when uh, they try to dodge you, they say, well, as an actor, I, well, you know, so I... Uh, I so, I, I, I didn't really know where to go from there, you know? So I said, um, well, um, well, where did you go to school? And so uh, I won't say it's the name of the school, but he told me the name of, you know, one of these, you know, prestigious, you know, acting schools, you know? You know, like, you know, like you know, Yale or Juilliard or one of them schools. I won't tell you which one. But he said, like, one of those schools. And so I said, well, um, well, what did they tell you there? And it was like a trigger, man. This brother just, he, he started off by saying something, you know, to the extent of, well, they said I should change the way I speak or kind of whatever. And then he just got angry. You know, like the sort of the memory of what that was, he just blew his freaking top. I mean, I felt like a wind was just like, boom, slamming me up against the wall, you know? And he went on like that for like about 10 minutes, you know? And then I slid down the wall and I said, do that. <laughs> you, know what I mean? you know, that's what that scene is about, you know. And so, you know, you know, in terms of culture and politics and stuff like that, you know, there is this thing about like reducing uh, who you are, you know, as a black person and like as an artist and stuff like that to eliminate your core and necessary anger, right? I mean, why should you not be pissed off at this experience of being black in America? How dare you deny us our anger? So I don't know how that relates to anything that's being said here, but I don't know, that was, that's my thing. That's an experience that this play has taught me about, you know, what, you know, you performers, you know, experience and have to go through. Sorry. 
I'm echoing again, but I also am at a loss for words and don't feel like I'm the one who should talk right now, frankly. Um, I, Carl, I know you had had something to say on the question. Uh, do we do we want to, Jessica? Jessica, yep. Well, <laughs> I uh, I just I'm just really uh, I will I want to say thank you to Dion initially for kind of answering that question and uh, thank you for sharing that, Carlisle. I. I myself, um, I don't know. I, I'm I'm pretty vulnerable right now, actually, and I had a pretty vulnerable experience with the play, um, and just kind of responding to hearing all of that information, and also um, opening up with all of that kind of history as well. Uh, for me, doing this project with you guys, like I I, I don't know Carlisle. I'm so excited to read more of your work. Um, but I had a, a really, I had a revelation. I was like, wow, you know, I don't actually know a lot of African-American playwrights and I know nothing about African-American theater history. Um, and I rarely get to work in a room with a lot of African-American artists. And, um, I was really, uh, nervous about going back into the dialects, you know, I was really nervous about, um, I was like, well, I don't, I don't really have this kind of dialect or this talk in my wheelhouse because the way that I was trained and all the work that I studied and the programs that I went through had nothing to do with the African-American diaspora. Um, I mean, ask me to do a Scottish or an Irish accent, like, sure, you know, <laughs> but I like, I don't even know if I can like, genuinely feel authentic in doing a kind of um, like a Southern accent or a West African accent. So I, I remember feeling a little bit of resistance uh, in reading the part that I read, because I was like, I don't know if I'm doing that right. And it was such an interesting thing to wrangle with, um, because I'm like, well, I'm black, I should know how to do this. Or like, <laughs> call my auntie on the phone, I should know how to do this. But I don't, because I don't know that I've consciously run away from it, but it hasn't, I haven't ever been given the opportunity to, to do that. I've never played a character um, that is specifically written for an African American. Uh, I've read a couple of scenes and I've, I've worked on monologues for auditions, but I've never been cast in a role uh, that is specific to being African American. I've never worked with an African American director. I've uh, never been in a play written by an African American. Um, and so that was a lot to uh, process. And so that's why this, uh, this project and meeting all of you guys and hearing you guys talk was a really kind of uh, profound experience for me. Um, and kind of like what to what Dion was saying about uh, had I known this stuff, um, going through school and and pursuing this as a as a career and a and a, and a lifestyle and uh, a way of being, you know, I have I have no idea about mm. any of this, and um, so that just really I, that just really hit me hard. And to kind of trickle it back to the question, you know, um, that was in the chat box about like this play now and we see white American theater and Black Lives Matter, you know, this whole year. I've been wrangling and struggling with like, what is, what is my radical responsibility in all of this? You know, like, what am I, how have I contributed to this as well by only pursuing a certain kind of theater or trying to attain a specific kind of goal or only auditioning for specific kinds of theater companies? You know, wh where's my part in this? And, and now what can I do to embrace and, and fully understand and educate myself um, about this wild, fascinating um, history that is a part of me that I just haven't been a part of. So that's, I just wanna offer that up and, uh, and I just wanna say thank you for this chat and also thank you for uh, me being a part of this whole process because it's it's really really hit me hard um, and I love I love the play so much and I love that scene with uh, Anne and Hewlett I was like oh my gosh this is it this is it explained all of the conversations that anyone ever has about how crazy that scene is I was like this is probably the coolest explanation or exploration of uh, the difficulties and complications of that scene so. 
Thank you, Jessica. Thank you. Um, Carl, I, I do feel like even if, if you don't necessarily want to, I do want to at least try to um, ask you about this because actually, um, you know, for me, obviously I'm completely ignorant of this and I recognize that as the moderator here and thank you all for dealing with me being in the room with you. But it was fascinating hearing what Dion was saying and then hearing Jessica talk about having never worked with an African-American director and realizing, you know, I've I've thought of you, Carl, as like, yeah, you're, I, I, I recognize what you are. You're an actor turned director. I get that journey. I get that. I've, I've been on that journey myself, but it had never occurred to me, of course, that your journey is so unique in this way because it was much more kind of groundbreaking and self-determining. And can you talk a little bit about that from your perspective as well, especially from like choosing to become a director? Um, yeah, but first and foremost, I, I just want to say thank you to Jessica for being so transparent and vulnerable on this platform. It's yeah. crazy. So that takes a tremendous amount of courage. And I just want to just shout that out. And thank you. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to just echo what a lot of people have said. When I was coming up, the traditional theater school was the virtues of Shakespeare were that it could withstand anything, the greatness of it. You could set it on the moon, you could set it here. And this is the mythology we were taught. Later on, when I decided to become a director, I wanted to prove that. And one of the things that resonates so much with me in Carlisle's play is when Billy Brown says, you are gonna get up there and you're gonna say, this is the winter of our discontent made glorious and they're gonna love it. it for me, what that meant is the summation basically of what Jessica and Dion were talking about. If you're fully authentic, that is more than enough. And I think that's one of the racial reckonings as a, as a globe we're at with right now. I think it's brilliant that Carlisle starts the play with the beautiful Paul Lawrence Dunbar's poem about we wear the mask, which it, it, it succinctly goes to the heart of being an, a, a black person in the world, the duality that we have to face. And for me, that's also revealed in the structure of how he writes that scene, right? Anne is royalty, but then she's also playing a part as being a, a, a washerwoman and a maid. There's this constant duality that exists in this world. And for black people all over, there's a duality. I can't raise my voice. When I direct a, a, a company of actors, I'm always having to uh, straddle a line that white counterparts just have a privilege and an automatic assertion that it's right. One last thing, and then I do wanna to get to your question, Nathan. I'll never forget in graduate school, I was uh, 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 coming from a, a classics in a much more uh, 21st century lens, a multicultural lens. So even if we're doing Ibsen, if we're doing Chekhov, if we're doing something, it's gotta have some, some black folks in it, some people of color. <laughs> I, I just, that's just the way I was. And I will never forget a very gifted actor, a, a beautiful brother got up and we were doing a piece and he said, finally, after what Carla was saying, we were going through it and we we're trying to navigate it. And he finally said, oh, can I be black? And it was one of these profound moments where of clarity for me, I was like, of course, what else would you be? And to Jessica's point, he said, I have never done a part where they've allowed me to fully be. And it was at the same time heartbreaking, but I also knew exactly what mask this brother has been forced to wear and carry. To Dion's point, if you are unburdened of that mask and that, 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 that gravity of having to wear this, imagine where your art can be. If you didn't have to burden yourself with the psychic energy it takes to comport and change in all, in all of this. So that is one thing. And to, to Nathan's uh, 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 question, it's, and I do not mean this in, in a grand way. At a certain point in my career, it was vitally important to me about what stories were going to be told and how they were going to be told. 
And I felt as a director, I would hopefully have a little more input into how those stories were brought to fruition. Um, so I began the journey to, to, to do that. Um, yeah, yeah, it's been a long ride, but uh, meeting Carlisle Brown, spending time with his text, not only this one, Pure Confidence, the Negro Peter the Great, and just like seeing this world from a different vantage point. This is the, uh, lastly, this is the duality that, that, that black artists have to do. We not only have to digest the curriculum that we're taught in theater schools and graduate schools, we have to also dig on our own for an independent study to get versed in the Carlisle Browns, to dig deeper into the Lynn Nottages, to support the Dominique Morris house coming up. It's a duality because if we uh, just allow the curriculum to dictate it, it's almost like we're cutting a, a part of ourselves, we're, we're leaving a part of ourselves at the door. Well, uh, Marvin, I feel like we need, we've talked a lot about education and what is and is not being taught and people committing their lives to make sure that stories are told that haven't been, it feels like we would be remiss in not hearing from you about that, um, given what you've centered your own work on. I, I, I must admit that hearing uh, Dion, Jessica, and Carl say these things about their education, um, that right now we're kind of living in a very different world right now in terms of education. Uh, and this is directly related to Black Lives Matter. The Black Lives Matter movements this summer shook a lot of college campuses. I mean, to the core. Theater departments all over the country were having meetings. I know my theater department did. They were having meetings all over the country responding to the sort of implied, inherent, pervasive whiteness and Eurocentrism in their departments. And the response to that, it's not a late response, it's not a behind the, behind the, the momentum response, it's a less, let's catch up response. Because a lot of curriculums and a lot of theater programs that I've taught at have had this history as a part of. Most theater programs that I've been a part of have had the history of the African theater, have had the history of William Brown, Ira Aldrich, uh, has had the history of William Wells Brown, who's an even more dynamic writer, if you can imagine that. Um, and so that history has always been a part of it. And so it's really a little strange and I, I'm not questioning it. It's just a little strange for me to hear um, that sort of lack of engagement with it because it's everywhere now. I'll just give you a, a clear cut example. Our university, Winthrop, has a diversity initiative where all across the campus, departments are looking at how they do theater history how they do Shakespeare, what's at the core of their material, what's at the core of it, and how they can include by uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color in that material. And it, it goes deep to the core. And it's not this. It's not, okay, let's make everybody teach or take this African-American theater course off to the side. No, it's how do we integrate all of this history into the history of Western theater, the history of West African theater the history of, 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 of American theater in a multi, from a multicultural lens or multiracial, multi-ethnic lens. And I think that um, from what I've seen, even before this moment, Black Lives Matter accelerated it and made it almost a, 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 a moment where these departments felt that if they did not do this, they would not survive and they would not have bodies to instruct. But I must say at all the, university, the universities that I've been at, this has been at the core. This history has actually been, Carlisle Brown, like I used to teach at Howard University. And what was Howard University doing? They were doing Carlisle Brown's play. That's what they were doing, you know? And, but that energy has been there for a while, but I think Black Lives Matter has made it more, has accelerated and made it more of a thing that this needs to be integrated into requirements of the curriculum, not a set aside thing where we have this black theater course over here. So it, it, it's changing, it's changing like rapidly and powerfully. Um, thank you, Marvin.
it's good to hear. <laughs> um, and I will say, actually, I think off of that, um, this has been an incredible conversation, y'all. Obviously, we haven't dug quite as much into the Q&A as we normally would, because that was what this conversation, I think, needed to be. And that was what it and that was great. I'm going to ask there's two questions. Um, and I'm sure that the audience understands that as as well. There are two of the questions that are up here that are somewhat related that I think maybe we could knock out because it seems like perhaps a logical maneuver from the conversation we've just had, which is both um, Terry Phillips and Julia Weissen um, are asking questions that are related. And I'll, I'll ask both of them. Terry, I know you raised your hand, but because I'm going to do it in two, I hope you'll forgive me for just reading it. Um, uh, and I, I, this is about um, ally, about allyship in this case, which is from Terry's perspective, does the panel have suggestions for non-African-American writers for portraying black characters authentically and respectfully? And Julia um, first thanks you all for this conversation and says hello to Carl, Julia Weissen, and asks as a white teacher of Shakespeare, what can be done to support and empower students of color um, in this particular case, middle and high school, but I would say all types. And uh, what would what would you have all have liked to hear from your white teachers um, when you were in high school, um, if you're willing to share that? I don't think you should feel like that has to be. Can we start with Carlisle, perhaps, about the playwright aspect of it, and then move from there? Oh, um, I'm sorry. I have no idea what white people should do. <laughs> but you may think, you know, I mean, um, you know, these things are related to process things. I mean, it's not like, you know, the people that you want to connect with are not like generality. So I think, you know, we can start from there. That like that nobody could really tell you, you know, how you can deal with another human being. You know, that's that's a question between you and your conscience and your heart. So. Any, any, does anyone have anything about like teaching or educating? I mean, obviously we've, we've addressed it to some extent, but. Um... I mean, it's hard to follow up Carlisle. The only thing I will add to that, <laughs> the only thing I will add to that, as um, directors, as educators, we have a profound responsibility and I liken it to, to, to doctors, the oath they take. First order of business is do no harm, right? The second point I would add to that is it takes a very, uh, um, the muscle of your creativity. We always need to be working it, right? What I can say from a personal experience, I owe a tremendous debt of gratitude to a white professor who when it was time for us to learn Shakespeare said, Carl, we're going into Shakespeare. You're gonna do Mark Anthony. I remember vividly saying to this professor, Shakespeare ain't never mess with me and I ain't gonna mess with Shakespeare. The professor like great educators saw something in me that I didn't even see in myself at the time and encouraged me and said, my voice was valid. That conversation changed the trajectory of my life. Because the next thing was in scene study class, when we're going down soliloquies and Hamlet and all of this, I came of age in the golden age of hip hop. And I had the permission to say, oh, this is like public enemy or KRS one saying this, but if I say it in my vernacular, it is just as valid. And it was reaffirmed. And with that permission, I was able to go on and imagine a world where Prospero is on the island of Hispaniola in the Dominican Republic. Shakespeare said that it's a magical island where, you know, sea sirens can rise up. I was like, yeah, to me, that's Haiti. Mm -hmm. I was able to imagine, and, and here again, this is not about me, but it's just about the permission and the support from an educator saying yes and, yes and. Um, so, so 
I think we have a tremendous responsibility if we're put in these positions, not to um, arrest the imagination, but to foster a room that is truly equitable and that all voices have a place at the table to eat. And we set the table up and we say, come sit down and feast. Uh, Nathan, if I could, just to make a very specific recommendation relative to that question, there's a book that some of you all might be familiar with and I'm gonna to try to show it up. It's called Black Acting Methods. And in particular, there's a great chapter in here, article in here by Justin Imika, who's a director and he I think he's directed at the, at the uh, Classical Theater of Harlem. And this is a great text for white teachers who just wanna get a start. I think Carlisle's exactly right. It's a deeper process than you can get from these books. But if you're looking for something to start with, I just recommend Black Acting Methods, Critical Approaches. You can get it on Amazon. Thanks, Barbara. It's actually, it's really helpful to have, I can tell you, it's very helpful to have concrete resources to go to. So thank you for that. Um, we're nearing our end, but Jessica, you had had something I think you had wanted to say. Um, I mean, it was just kind of in regards to the, the teaching question. Um, and it was just something that I remember that I kind of maybe compartmentalized or just put away and, just traumatic learning experiences. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I kind of was introduced to Shakespeare uh, in in my drama class in uh, in junior high school and like initially kind of fell in love with it and was always a attached to it and kind of never looked back. But whenever scene assignments were made or um, teachers, uh, you know, told me to work on something, it was always the fools. It was always... <laughs> The, el the older people, the shepherds um, and the boys. And so I, without really thinking about it through my kind of what would have been, not that I'm necessarily an ingenue, but what would have been <laughs> those years for me, I made an agreement to myself that was like, I'm never going to be able to play the lover. I'm never going to be able to play um, any of the female heroines in Shakespeare. I'm always going to be cast as the, as you know, the men, the, the soldiers, um, the amazing character roles that there are, you know, and I just, um, and then I, I got cast as, as Viola one time and I was so, so confused and so relieved. And I realized that up until that point, I had made this agreement to myself that no one was ever gonna cast me as a female lead in Shakespeare. So just, I guess in the advice there is just, you know, um, all the beautiful shades of wonderfulness you have in your classroom, just make sure they get to dip their toes in everything, in a little bit of everything. Like don't allow people to typecast themselves, you know, <laughs> before they even step into their careers, I guess. Um, just keeping that space of creativity and possibility wide open, I would that would be my offering. Thank you, Justin. You know, the, you know, I, you know, I do solo shows. I wouldn't say I know that much about, you know, acting. I, I, you know, I love actors. I mean, of course, you know, um, I'm in the business of putting words in your mouth. So that we're like, you know, we're most the most essential kind of, you know, collaborators. But, you know, I sort of feel like, you know, there's certain ideas about acting, about schools of acting, you know, it's like, you know, you know, Stanislavski or Meisner or Weisenheisner or kind of whatever, you know. You know, and as a playwright, you know, I don't really care really about any of that. You know, it's really to me like about what 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 works for you, you know, and, and I think it's all good. But at the end of the day, you know, whatever I ha and in in character you inhabit, the only thing you can bring to it is you. Right. And so, you know, so that anything obstructs that is of no use to you as an actor. Um, and on that note, I did promise that I wouldn't hold you all past 830, though I could listen to this conversation for hours. Um, thank you to everyone in the audience who asked your questions. Um, apologies to those of you whose questions I didn't get to, but I hope you understand. Um, Thank you to all of you. Um, I can only speak for myself, but it was it was a, both a privilege and an education and a joy to be in the room with you all today. And I so appreciate 
Thank you, you guys. It's been an honor. Thank you yes. so much. Thank you all. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm going to say a few things about what's coming up next for Red Bull. You guys can hang out or bail early as you wish. It's all good. Um, um, for those of you who are uh, in the, who are um, still with us with the attendees, uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, once again, you can watch this show for one more day. Um, this particular couple of you have asked, this particular uh, bowl session uh, will live in perpetuity on the Red Bull YouTube page if you want to direct other people towards it. Uh, the next couple of projects we have are the on the 25th of January, we have uh, The Woman Hater by Frances Burney, one of the earliest um, female playwrights. And... Um, that will be followed up in mid-February by The Bell's Stratagem by Hannah Cowley, another early female playwright. So please do check out both of those. Information can be found on the Red Bull website. Also, if you have enjoyed tonight's programming, uh, please do consider making a tax-deductible donation to Red Bull Theater. Everything that we are providing in these trying times are completely free to the public, but they do take funds. And so, of course, we appreciate anything you can give to allow us to continue to um, show work like this and like the reading and like the readings upcoming. Thank you all for sharing this evening with me. 